spirituality is a word that can get you into a lot of trouble. <laughs> so um, perhaps I should start off by saying that something I've realized recently is that although I'm an atheist and have been for a very long time, I have a lot of interest in religion. Um, in, in one simple sense, for instance, in music, I think probably I listen to more gospel music than any other form of music. Gospel music is, to me, the most exciting form of sung music. Um, and funnily enough, when I'm not listening to gospel music, I'm often listening to Russian Orthodox chants. That's another beautiful form of music for me. Um, so I've always thought, how can I, there must be a disconnect in my brain because I'm very impressed by this music, but I know exactly why that music is made, of course. It's made to exercise a kind of spirituality towards an idea of God. So I thought, what am I not? What's the disconnect in my mind here? And I've come to realize that I don't believe in God, but I do believe in religion. <laughs> so I think religion is a very powerful tool for people. It's a very powerful way of creating community. Like all powerful tools, it's a very dangerous one as well. Um, you know, everything, everything that has the power to be really good has the power to be really dangerous as well. Fire is a good example. Um, so you're playing with fire with, with religion. You have to be careful with it. But, but I do think that more and more I'm, I'm understanding that the role of religion is to create a community of people who are concerned, A, about the long future. They're thinking not only about themselves, but their children and their grandchildren and so on and so on. And they're thinking about the codes of conduct that will bind those people together and make a world that is tolerable for them. Secondly, they're thinking about the idea of empathizing horizontally. So vertical empathy is thinking about thinking into the deep future. Horizontal empathy is thinking about all of us together. Religion is very much about us. What gets dangerous is when it becomes about us and them, when it becomes a way of isolating or scapegoating a group of people. But when it is at its best, it gives people a framework within which they can act in a very, very civilized way to each other, a very compassionate and helpful way. Um, there's a film I would like to mention to you. It's a documentary made by Sophie Fines called Hoover Street Revival. Um, she made it about maybe 20 years ago now. And it's about a church in South Central Los Angeles called Hoover Street Revival. Um, it's in one of the most desperately poor parts of America. And this church, which is a gospel church with a big, big congregation, lots of singing and all the things you expect in a gospel church, is not only a church, it's a creche, it's a place for people who are homeless, it's a place for kids who are living in difficult households where, and don't have a space to do their homework in, it's a place for un unmarried mothers to come, it's a place for drug addicts to try to find themselves again, it's a place for Saturday morning classes for young children who are dropping behind at school. It does everything you would want a state to do and everything that the state doesn't do for these people. It, it is the center of their lives in the sense that it is the place where they go to help each other. Um, now, you might laugh at the, I don't laugh, but one might laugh at the content of the religion. You know, I'm sure there are among these congr congregants, there are people who believe all the weird things that religious people do believe, like the earth is flat and 
started 4,700 years ago or something like that. But do you know what? I don't give a fuck, really. What I care about is the fact that this institution gives these people some dignity and some, um, what can you say, some shelter, some help. So, okay, so this is all a way of getting around to answering your question. Um, so spirituality, in a sense, is a way of saying there are other things that bind us than our salaries and what car we have and those sorts of the kinds of things that a capitalist economy tells us we should be caring about. This says there are other things. There are lots of other things. We don't even have to enumerate them. We kind of know what they are. Um, my most recent thinking has been that the only way we will save this planet from becoming hell, a version of hell, is by making it the center of our personal religious practice. So what I thought, the other morning I woke up and I wrote down, I thought, if we could persuade the military that the thing they have to defend is the planet, and if we could persuade um, religious people that God is really life, life, <laughs> life is God, that's to say all the stuff that we see around us evolving and getting destroyed in fires. Um, if we could make that the center of religious practice and we could make protection of that the center of military practice, there might be a chance that we could survive. Imagine if we could put all the many kinds of wealth that go into military operations, not only money, which we all know about, you know, Afghanistan, we just read now cost $2 trillion, $2 trillion. Does anyone know how big a trillion is? It's big. Um, suppose all of that money had been spent on trying to make better conditions in the first place to make a, a world that behaved differently, that didn't produce Afghanistans and Talibans and, and uh, colonial powers. Then suppose that um, all the religions of the world with their billions of adherents were putting that intelligence and passion and commitment into looking after the only thing that we know we share, which is this, this place, wouldn't that be the answer? Wouldn't, wouldn't we be getting somewhere then? Those two things, military and religion, are two huge human projects. Between them, they take up, you know, probably 50% of our tax money and our attention. Um, why not direct them into the right place? Why not somehow redirect them? So this is an interesting problem that you could all work on. How do we do that? How do we, how do we persuade governments that... I, I, I would like to go to a government and say, look, I'm not a pacifist. I'm not coming here to say, get rid of your military. I'm coming here to say, make your military do what it should be doing. Make it protect us. And what I need protection from is not the Chinese or the Russians or all the other people I'm told are the enemies. I need protection from global warming. I need protection from climate change. I need all of that money that you're using now and all of that intelligence. Because, you know, remember about 40% of physicists are engaged in working on defense and about 20% of chemists and so on and so on there's a huge engagement of human intelligence going into defense, but it isn't defending us against anything. Just take the project and do it fucking properly. <laughs> do you know, the project is a good idea. 
defend us. Yes, of course, we need defense, just like your body needs an immune system. We need defense, but we need to be defended against the right things. You know, at the moment, what we're doing is we're, we're taking, um, no, no, I won't go into an analogy. That's enough. Sorry. Anyway, thank you for that question. It's, it's been something I've been thinking about a lot recently. 